Stephen Canals, uh, your writer, director, producer, and showrunner for Pose, uh, and much has been made over the years uh, about how groundbreaking the show's representation is on screen, uh, but the show also represents the queer community really well behind the camera. Um, so I'm wondering, when assembling a creative team uh, like this, uh, what are sort of the avenues for finding uh, talent who historically haven't maybe been reached out to by the industry as much? Well, I think the first step is to have incredible co-conspirators like everyone at FX and John Langraff in particular, who says, I believe in you, I believe in this project and in your voice, and I'm going to support it. Um, it's obviously having incredible co-creators like Ryan Murphy uh, and Brad Falchuk, who also are fully on board and believers. And in the case of our cast, specifically um, having a casting director like Alexa Fogel, who has worked on incredible shows like Atlanta and The Wire. Um, and I cite The Wire specifically because similar to Pose, she had the experience on that series of finding untapped talent, you know, going out into a community and finding the people whose stories are going to be captured on screen. Um, and then casting those individuals, in many cases for the first time, um, but giving them an opportunity to tell their own story. Uh, and you, know, you mentioned The Wire, and that reminds me of what's sometimes extraordinary about um, you know, reaching out to people who are relative newcomers or aren't as well known is that you can make a star and that's where it starts. Like, you know, we have Idris Elba because of The Wire and so many other actors uh, from that show. Um, and that could be the legacy of Pose. We you know, have the largest uh, trans a cast of regulars in, in TV history and now they can go and make other history. Uh, so is it exciting to see, you know, what doors are opened for the people who you who kind of got in the door thanks to this show? Absolutely. I mean, you look just this week, you know, uh, Billy Porter, you know, all the images went out. Uh, he's playing uh, the fairy godmother in the Cinderella film. Um, obviously, you know, Dominique Jackson is working on American Gods, which, which airs on stars and um, you know, MJ Rodriguez, who's our lead and plays Blanca on the show, uh, is going to be in the new Maya Rudolph series on Apple TV Plus. And so, you know, it's really exciting to see the ways that all of these really talented performers who just needed an opportunity, they just needed a chance to show that they have the goods, now have opportunities beyond our show. That's it's pretty remarkable. And, and I hope that the industry at large will continue to use Pose as um, you know, a really a case study to say, look, this is what we really should continue to do. Like we should continue to invest in stories that historically have been pushed to the margins. Um, and we should continue to invest specifically in Black and Latinx, uh, you know, Indigenous and Asian voices, because, you know, we're, we're way past this moment in our industry where those narratives are simply seen as niche. You know, the reality is that niche is now the new mainstream and our modern day audience really does want more specificity in their narratives. And so I think we prove that. Um, you know, if, if you lean into the universal truths of a story, the audience will show up regardless of who's being centered. Yeah, it, it sort of reminds me, uh, there's a moment in, uh, as we're recording this episode that hasn't aired, I won't give away any specifics, but like there's a mm -hmm. reference to Sex in the City and you look back mm -hmm. and you think, it's almost um, like at the time it seemed kind of matter of fact, but you look back now, it's almost impossible to imagine a show set in New York City where like the main cast is entirely white and uh, pr primarily straight. And, you know, so it's, it's you know, you can almost sort of see that uh, in 20 years, what that, uh, what the paradigm has, has, you know, switched to or is switching to, I don't think we're entirely, you know, out of that uh, paradigm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because to your point, I mean, if you go back, I mean, Sex and the City wasn't that long ago, right? I think the first season started airing in like 98, 99 on HBO and, the reality is that like I grew up as a queer Afro-Puerto Rican 
in the South Bronx, you know, like my New York never looked like the New York of Sex in the City. So the reality is, you know, it's that show just it captured. And to be clear, like I'm a fan of Sex and City. I really appreciate the show and what it represents. Um, but, you know, that's just one version of New York. You know, I, I specifically having this conversation with you now, I'm thinking about the critique that was lobbed at Lena Dunham when Girls was released, right? And again, people were like, that doesn't necessarily look like my New York. And I think that, you know, there is room for all of these narratives to exist. You know, I think that what we're doing, what I wanted to accomplish with Pose was to take that camera that has so firmly been planted and directed at our white, straight, cisgendered counterparts and just shift it 15 degrees to say, hey, guess what? There's like a whole other group of people who existed in this environment as well. And they were also having an experience. And let's just highlight that. Yeah, as, as a fellow Afro-Puerto Rican from Bronx, I can relate to that um, and to uh, just the idea of if you, you know, if you you can't see it, you can't be it, uh, in a sense. Exactly. So, you know, growing up, not seeing representations of myself necessarily, uh, it's hard to know where you fit in the world. Did you ever have mm -hmm. that feeling uh, or, or did you always know you wanted to create that or uh, did you ever wonder what space there was or if there was space for you? Especially that's an interesting. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, the truth is that no, I mean, I I grew up in housing projects in the South Bronx, and this was in the midst of both the HIV/AIDS epidemic and the crack epidemic, both of which are highlighted on Pose. And uh, you know, there were no models. There was no one that was living in my neighborhood, no one in my environment, no one in my community who was aspiring to make it in Hollywood. You know, I didn't I didn't know anyone who was creating content. And so I was solely a consumer up until the age of 15 when I joined an after school program and someone put a camera, literally put a camera in my hand and said, this is how you use it. Now go go shoot, go go create content. Up until that point, it hadn't even occurred to me that I could be the person responsible for creating content. Um, and so, uh, you know, obviously I feel really strongly about the importance of those types of interventions, like after school programs, um, where we encourage young people to use their voices. But the other thing is, and I know this will resonate for you, is that where were we on television at that time? You know, like in the eighties and nineties, frankly, where are we on TV now? But, you know, in those days we weren't taking up any space. <laughs> and if you saw us, I think you know, similar to other things that were shared already with some of the other folks here, it's like, we were like, we're the drug dealer, we're the thug, we're the body in the gutter, you know, it's like, we were, we're the, we're the help, <laughs> you know, it's like, where were we centered positively? You know, where was that representation? It just, it didn't exist. Um, and so once I made the decision to move to, to Los Angeles, to pursue this career, it became all the more important for me to craft narratives where my community is centered positively. Uh, and one of the things that I find so uh, uh, impactful about Pose um, is that you know the show doesn't shy away from how difficult and how tragic uh, sometimes you know lives of queer people during the '80s and '90s in New York could be, but mm -hmm. it the show also kind of is almost defiantly joyful at in places mm -hmm. where. You know, it makes a point to center, like, these are black and brown, queer, trans lives, and they are full of joy, they are full of family, they laugh, they succeed, uh, uh, they, they, they have their triumphs, they aren't just the victims of the narrative uh, or, or the side of someone else's narrative. Uh, did that feel, like, how important did it feel, like, to, to represent the joy of, of these characters? It was incredibly important. I mean, truth be told, first season, the show was really dark. You know, uh, this was breaking the first season, I should say. Um, you know, I was leaning into the reality of what it meant to be in New York in the 80s and 90s. And it was a really bleak time for the city. It was especially tough if you happen to be Black or Latin. Um, and it was, we were already about two episodes into the first season. 
And Ryan Murphy gave me a note. He just said, you know, that joy that you have being a queer person of color, I want to feel that joy on the page. And that's when I went back to the pilot and I completely revamped, we collectively reworked that narrative. Um, and that's the show now that we have, which is, you know, it honors resilience and love and family, and it's a more hopeful and aspirational show. You know, I think that came out of really Ryan's prompting me and saying, I want to feel that joy on the page. Um, I think it's incredibly important that, you know, the audience recognizes uh, that we are, we being, you know, queer and trans, black and brown people, that we're so much more than our traumas, you know, and more often than not, historically, especially in film and television, that's where our narratives are rooted. And so on Pose, we're making, it doesn't, I don't want to use the word subversive because it doesn't feel like a subversive choice. It feels like one that is just truthful and honest, right? But we're making an intentional choice to say, we don't need to lean into all of the darkness, you know, that we are a multitude of things, you know, and, and the reality is that even for me, having grown up in that environment, I'm sure this is the case for you too, that yeah, there were a lot of hardships and there were difficult times, but there was also a lot of love and there was a lot of laughter and there was a lot of joy. And so the show was trying to honor all facets of what it means to live a life. Uh, well, congratulations on the show. Uh, your work over three seasons, uh, you know, the, the third and final season is currently airing as we're recording this. Um, and uh, thank you so much for talking to me about it. Uh, well, we'll have you back you. Uh, for our uh, group discussion soon. Great, thanks.